Hi everyone, welcome to the seminar of the Escuela de Gobierno, Universidad de Orfugáñez. Today we have a very, an excellent guest, one of the leader in the field of economics of education and also in mobility and social mobility, uh, John Friedman from the Brown, from the Department of Economics of Brown University. He has this recent paper that he has uh, put available for everyone and that already will get, it's getting cited already at this very moment. Uh, it's called Diversifying Society's Leaders, the Causal Effects of Admission to Highly Selective Private Colleges. John will uh, present for our, uh, about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we have someone who has worked on these issues in Chile, Sebastián Gallego, the, our professor in Universidad de Lugania. So, okay, thank you, John, for being here. Uh, you can start. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Bernardo, for the invitation to present. Thank you in advance to Sebastián for your, your comments on this. Really excited to engage with you and everybody else um, on this work. Uh, this is joint with uh, my co-authors, Raj Chetty and uh, Dave Deming. And I want to start by just giving two different uh, motivating facts. So the first one is that um, students from, you know, we're going to talk about schools at uh, kind of a very small uh, elite tier uh, within the United States. Uh, these are the Ivy League schools. Uh, plus Chicago, Duke, Stanford, and MIT. Um, and, uh, you know, these schools have a very small fraction of all college attendees, uh, less than 1%. And even if you look among uh, student, among adults who earn, say, in the top 25% of the income uh, distribution, the uh, individuals that attended these 12 schools uh, are only 1.4% of them. But when you get up to the very, very top of the income distribution, uh, the top 1%, the top 0.1%, you see that uh, students from these schools start to uh, account for a very, very large share, uh, you know, more than 13% of those in the top 1,000th of the income distribution. And this is not just true when measuring outcomes by income. This is also true, for instance, when measuring um, kind of arts and sciences outcomes. So 20% of students that attend uh, top ranked graduate programs uh, come from these 12 undergraduate institutions. 28% uh, of those who receive the very prestigious MacArthur Genius Grants uh, come from these schools. And then when you look in uh, public service uh, in the United States, you know, a very, very large fraction of those in uh, prominent positions come from these schools. Um, and so, uh, you know, based on, you know, similar work, I, you know, it's very similar in, in Chile. Um, but I think, uh, you know, that kind of raises the possibility, right? These schools seem like a very, very important pathway towards these uh, particular, uh, you know, leadership positions in society. At the same time, um, admissions in the United States, especially to these schools, does not work like it does in Chile based just on a test score and applications. It's based on uh, a so-called holistic review where uh, there are recommendations and essays and all sorts of stuff that goes into it. And what that results in is a system where even among students here who have uh, scored very, very similarly on the college admissions test, this plots the fraction of them that attend just one of the 12 schools I'm looking at, at Yale, right? The fraction is three times higher among individuals that come from very high income families than come from middle and low income families. Um, and so this disparity in access combined with this, you know, potential of these schools really um, uh, being a pathway, I think raises the question, uh, do these very highly selective private colleges amplify the persistence of privilege across generations, or you know, flipping it around a little bit, could they serve to diversify society's leaders by changing their admissions policies? Uh, and uh, of course, the answer to this broader question is gonna depend on two more specific research questions, and that's what I'm gonna try to answer today. So the first one is about the inputs to these universities. That's just answering 
what's really an accounting question, why are students from high income families more likely to attend these highly selective private colleges, right? Even relative to uh, other students with the same test score. And the key here is we're gonna try to decompose this between factors that seem to relate to choices that the students are making, like where to apply to school, versus choices that the school itself is making, like whom to admit among the applicant pool, with the idea that the school has you know, very tight control over choices that it makes, but only indirect control over the choices that the students make. And so knowing something about where the pipeline is leaking, to, to use a, a metaphor, will help us learn something about what policies might improve access at these universities. And then a second question, uh, we want to know what the causal effect of changing access to these colleges would be, right? If all those uh, great outcomes for students that attended these schools resulted only from the fact that these students are hugely selected in the first place and there was no causal effect of attendance, then I think you know, it would be more difficult to see why we should really care about these uh, universities changing their policies. And so on both of these questions, um, I think we're able to make progress because uh, we've pulled together, I think, uh, what is a pretty unique set of data, right? Unlike Chile, uh, the system here is very decentralized. Um, and so we're going to combine data uh, from centralized records in uh, the federal government on income taxes um, and on where students attend college with data from private test companies that run the college admissions exam. Um, with uh, a fourth set of records on application and admissions from inside each of these different colleges, right? So these admissions processes are, are totally decentralized. And so we have data from inside several of these very elite Ivy Plus universities, several of the larger public universities, and then several of these large systems like the UC system in California, the Texas system. And what these uh, internal college records include are a number of very detailed characteristics of students, of their applications, of how admissions officers that are conducting this process rated their applications, and then ultimately what the outcome of the admissions was in a way that's gonna help us to both uh, suss out what's uh, the reason for this leaky pipeline in the first question, and then also to generate quasi-experimental identification on the causal effect of these schools in the second question. So let me jump right in, and I should say along the way, please jump in if you have a, a clarifying question. Um, I, I would hate to uh, get to the end and realize that you know people haven't understood um, what I'm presenting. Uh, let me start with this question, why are students from high-income families more likely to attend uh, selective colleges? So we're actually going to start from a baseline that would essentially be uh, the system in, in Chile, where uh, suppose that only a student's test score determined where they went to school. Why are we going to do that? Because we want to be able to adjust for the very large disparities by socioeconomic status that occur before college. And so, um, you know, for students that are applying to a very academically elite school, we want to uh, judge them and the students who attend relative to an appropriate baseline. And we're going to do that by um, looking at the scores of students who attend. So it's not the case, and this I guess is a little bit of a, a difference from Chile, it's not the case that a school has to take only the students with the highest scores. But what we do think is a, is a relevant benchmark is that among students with a given score, they should not be more likely to admit students who are from different parent income families. And so how do we do that? We're going to take uh, graphs like this. This is what I showed you before. So this is the, the fraction of students from each parent income uh, percentile that attend Yale with a given score, right? You could draw this curve for every single test score for every single university. And then within each university, so for instance, within Yale, we're going we're gonna to weight together all of these different functions at all the different levels of test score using the distribution of test scores among students who attend, right? So what that's gonna to lead to is a plot that looks like this. We, once, we norm, once we weight everything together, we normalize it by the average attendance rate just because the levels are very hard to interpret once weighted. And what you see is that um, you know, relative to a baseline attendance rate, 
students from middle income families, these are uh, students, for instance, in, with parent income percentiles around the 70th or the 80th percentile of the income distribution in the US. So think about somebody with earnings around 100,000 US dollars. Those students have a, a relative attendance rate of only 0.78. So that's saying they're 22% less likely to attend these schools than students uh, on average with the same test score. Whereas students from the top 1% of the income distribution, those are uh, students from families earning more than about $600,000 uh, per year, they are 80% uh, more likely than average to attend these schools. And, and you, do, you can see if you come from the top 0.1%, these are families with incomes above about $3 million a year, right? They're about two and a half times more likely to attend these schools than uh, other, you know, the average student with that same um, level of income. Another way, let me just say to interpret what this curve means is to consider the following counterfactual. Suppose that you took all students attending a given university and one by one, you replaced each student with a student chosen randomly from all of the students in the country that scored exactly the same on the test in the same high school graduation year, right? One by one, there's a student with a, uh, a score of 1500, replace them with an, uh, of the, all the 1500 scores in the country, pick one randomly. There's a student with a 1400, replace them with a randomly chosen 1400, right? That's gonna put together a, uh, a counterfactual class of students, which by construction has exactly the same distribution of test scores as the actually attending class. What this graph shows is how many students are actually attending relative to the number who are attending from each parent income group in my counterfactual class, right? So this is saying that there are two and a half, time, uh, two and a half times more students from very, very wealthy families than you would expect in my counterfactual uh, test score based class. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this in the paper, but this is something that differs um, uh, quite a bit across different schools. Um, so and it just kind of draws this line separately for uh, four different schools. Um, you know, we, we put out all these data publicly um, uh, and, and, you know, we hope that this will be helpful in, um, uh, as, as people try to understand um, what's going on. Um, I want to flag also that there seems to be important differences using this method between those most elite private schools in the United States versus the most elite public schools. So the green line is just what I showed you before. The yellow line is what you get if you do the exact same thing for the most elite nine public schools in the United States. So what you see is that, right, the pattern at a very high level looks similar, right? The high income students are more likely to be attending than low income students with the same test score. But the exact shape of the line is very different. And in particular, uh, rather than having this big spike up at the top, you see a broader pattern where students that are roughly in the top five or 10% are overrepresented but it's not something that's hugely concentrated among very, very high income families. And so uh, I'll show you in a second, um, like I think what, what we think is going on there. So just to put a quantitative number, what does the fact that you have this very skewed attendance profile mean? Um, well, there's about 1,650 students in the average starting first year class at each of these Ivy Plus schools. And so concretely, what does it mean? Suppose that instead of having these very high attendance rates for these high income students, suppose that we replace that high attendance rate with the attendance rate for the middle income students. Now, quantitatively, what that is, is saying, you know, the number of, of students from top 1% families, the actual attendance, that is just the combination of the number of students in the population from the top 1% times the rate at which students from the top 1% attend these schools at each test score level A. And so all we're going to do is we're going to replace the actual attendance rate for the top 1% at a given test score level 
with this counterfactual attendance rate for students from the middle class with exactly the same test score. And we can then project, how would that change the class? Well, I mentioned that there are about 106, uh, six, sorry, 1,650 students in each first year class. Because of these higher attendance rates, there are 168 extra students from the top 1% than there would be if they attended at these middle income rates. So more than one tenth of the class uh, are these extra uh, top 1% students. And then you see that you know, there are further extra students that we're not yet counting kind of above the 90th percentile. And so what I now wanna do is I basically just wanna decompose this 168. Why is it that these 168 students are there? Um, and so I'm gonna run through, oh shit, uh, my bottle of water. Um, I'm gonna run through this um, kind of quickly. I'm happy to dive into it in the questions. But uh, you know, the primary thing we see is that it's driven by admissions decisions, right? It's not about students applying. It's not about students choosing to attend or not attend once they've been admitted, right? In our decentralized system, you can get admitted to many schools and then it's the student's choice to, to decide where they wanna go. Largely what's happening is that schools are just choosing to admit students from high income families at higher rates than students from especially middle income families, right? Note that these relative admissions rates, we're using the same reweighting here. So we're comparing students with the same test score across the graph. The students with the lowest admissions rates are these students from, the, from middle income families. And then it's a little bit higher for students from low income families. And it really spikes up for students from very, very high income families. Just to put some numbers on this, um, students from the highest income families um, are nearly three times as likely to be admitted to these schools relative to students from these middle income families with the same test score. And that's uh, something that's very specific to the private schools. So if you draw the same graph with admissions rates at the public schools, not only is there no spike up at the top, the whole thing is basically flat. So what this is saying is that, again, it's not like the public schools are only taking students with the highest uh, test scores, but once you get a test score, it doesn't really matter what your parent income is. You have roughly the same chance of being admitted. If anything, a slightly higher chance for students from low income families. What is happening at the public schools? Well, there, that disparity that I showed you is largely being driven by application rates. High income students in the yellow here are more likely to, uh, to be apply to these uh, most selective public institutions. That's true a little bit for students from high income families applying to uh, the most selective private schools, but much, much less so. And so um, just kind of skipping through in the interest of time, right? we can decompose what's going on in this 168 about half of it is coming from uh, non-athletic admissions. About 34, uh, that's about uh, a fifth is coming from application and about 20, that's about uh, you know, one eighth is coming from the choices of the students to, to matriculate. There's this empty slice here that I've not yet filled in. Um, as many of you know, among the weirder things that American universities do, uh, we have sports teams that compete for the university, uh, students who play for those teams receive enormous advantages in the admissions process. And it turns out at these very selective schools, the athletes who receive those admissions advantages by and large come from very high income families. So what this plot shows, this is just a, a simple version. This just asks what share of all admitted students to these colleges are these athletes? It's about 10% on average, but it's more like 5% of students from low-income families and more like 13% of students from high-income families. And so uh, the fact that um, Brown University chooses to have a football team and we recruit many high-income students to be on the football team, um, that uh, fact accounts for this other uh, slice here. And since the choice to recruit athletes and the choice um, to, to do other stuff in admissions, these are all choices of the institution. To pull it back to that original question that I posed, uh, we think about two thirds of this entire 168 are driven by choices 
that the institution itself is making. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on this to kind of drag us into the weeds, but let me just uh, go forward a couple more slides here. Um, within these um, uh, 87 extra students, uh, we think that uh, the two key things that are going on are preferences for the children of students whose parents attended the same institution. That's something, again, that our uh, universities explicitly and publicly do. Uh, like a, a, a child who applies to Brown, who's the, the daughter or son of a Brown alumnus, is, has, has preferential admission. Um, and then there's um, a final part here which has to do with the fact that as part of this holistic admissions process, um, the admissions officers here care a lot about various non-academic credentials like the extracurriculars that you do, things about your personality, the essay that you write, the recommendation letters that come from your teachers and your school, all of which seem to uh, largely favor students from uh, quite high income backgrounds. So, the bottom line that I want you to take away from this first part of the presentation is that there are more students from high income families at these schools, largely because of choices that the schools make about who they want to admit. So that of course then raises the possibility if they change who they want to admit, that seems like a fairly straightforward way to change the set of students that are attending these schools. Now let me move on to the second part of the talk to say, well, what effect would that have? Would that matter at all? And I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, go about this part of the paper where, right, the goal is to identify the causal effect of uh, attending one of these schools using um, primarily a research design uh, based on idiosyncratic variation in admissions, right? The, the, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the experiment I want you to have in mind in a second, but what we're after here, motivated by the first part of the talk, is to say, well, what's the causal effect if we were to just let the next person on the on the admissions list in? Um, because it seems like admissions is the key uh, is the key margin for these schools. In the paper, we also uh, estimate these causal effects using a, a different admission, a different design. Um, this is a design that was popularized by uh, Stephanie Dale and uh, Alan Kruger about twenty years ago where they look at students who got into two different, two or more different institutions and then compare just which they choose to attend. And so that is a different set of identification assumptions relying on idiosyncratic uh, student choice over where to matriculate. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna focus on the, the first one, um, but uh, we, we get pretty similar results. So let me just uh, take five minutes to walk you through with just I'll try to be a little bit precise about what we wanna do um, in this first admissions design. So an empirical model of college admissions has student I applying to some set of colleges. Each college is indexed by J. When a student applies to a college, the college admissions office assesses that student's quality, which is denoted ZIJ. What determines student quality? There are observable characteristics, uh, X1, and there are unobservable characteristics, that is aspects of the application that the admissions office sees, but we do not see, uh, X2. Different schools are allowed to place different weights on each of those characteristics. So those weights are gamma 1J, gamma 2J. And then there's some set of um, uh, other uh, unobservables. Uh, and again, the key difference between the X2 unobservable and the uh, these other uh, error terms is that we're going to assume that all of the potential endogeneity, the selection, is going to occur on this X2. So that is X2 may potentially relate to outcomes. I'll show you that in a second. Eta I and epsilon Ij do not relate to outcomes. And what's in, going to be particularly important here is that epsilon, you know, A to I is something that makes a student more or less likely to be admitted across all colleges. Epsilon IJ, that is a shock that makes a student more likely to be admitted at a particular college. And so what we're going to want to try to do is find variation in admissions from this epsilon IJ, because that's the component of the assessment of student quality and therefore the component of admissions that's gonna be orthogonal to all this other stuff. Now, once each college has this ZIJ, they're gonna admit the student if the ZIJ is above some uh, school-specific threshold. 
Uh, P and D are going to denote whether a student uh, is admitted to uh, and attends a college respectively. Then there's, uh, after students go to college, they go out into the labor force and they uh, have different outcomes. Uh, we're going to study a range of outcomes, but let's just uh, talk about earnings for the moment. Their earnings, uh, YI, is a function, first of all, of what college J they attended. And so this fee J, that is the uh, causal effect of college attendance on uh, earnings. Um, and then we're going to let both this X1 and the X2 potentially impact long-term earnings. Um, and then there's another um, error term here. Again, by definition, uh, all of the uh, endogeneity of the selection is contained in this X2. And so this uh, epsilon IY is um, uncorrelated with the, the epsilon IJ. And so our goal is basically to estimate this um, uh, phi uh, IV plus. And of course, the obvious problem is that if we just ran this regression, because we can't control for the X2s, uh, we would be uh, potentially biased. For instance, if students with higher X2s are both more likely to attend certain colleges and more likely for other reasons to earn uh, high uh, wages in the labor market. So what we're gonna do to try to isolate these idiosyncratic factors, epsilon ij, is to take advantage of this fact that I told you that admissions at these schools relates not just to stuff like test scores, but also to a bunch of pretty idiosyncratic stuff. So let me tell you a story. I sat in many admissions committee meetings that decided on how to admit students over the years doing this paper. And there was uh, this one set of cases, I'll never forget, uh, a student came up and they're all, everybody's looking at this kind of set of summary statistics on the student. And the student was like totally fine academically, but like not a standout. What really stood about the student is that they played the, uh, the oboe. And somebody said, you know what? Uh, we actually need an oboe player for our orchestra this year. The oboe player currently is in the orchestra is like gonna graduate next year. Let's admit this student who's like totally fine academically, but like they will play the oboe in our orchestra. Everybody said, great, they admitted the student. A little while later, another student came up who was uh, very similar academically that student played the trumpet. And while they did not specifically discuss the fact that they did not need a trumpet player for the orchestra, like that did not come up. No one made a particular argument to admit the trumpet player based on the orchestra. This student was not admitted. And so the, the variation that I want you to have in mind as an example is that unless you think that playing the oboe as opposed to playing the trumpet is a very important long-term indicator of earnings potential, that's a set of, that's a comparison that's great for us, right? The kind of for random reasons, they admitted one, they did not admit the other, and now we can compare the two going into the long term in order to uh, estimate the causal effect of these uh, colleges. Now, of course, we can't literally do that. Uh, what we're going to do to approximate that in the data is to start by looking at students who are placed on the wait list. So I need to tell you a little bit more institutionally about how admissions at these school works. Students are admitted um, uh, first in around in December uh, and then in around in March to uh, start school at the beginning of the American academic year in September. When you're admitted, you get until the beginning of May to uh, accept. And because it's a decentralized admission system, uh, the schools don't quite know who's going to come. And so they always need to have what they call the wait list. That is the set of students who were kind of right on the bubble, not quite admitted, so that if they get too few students who uh, end up choosing to come, they can go to the wait list and admit more students so that they have a full class. And so by focusing on the wait list, right, we kind of have this logic of like a regression discontinuity. Um, but you can't quite do um, an RD because there's no, right, because exactly it's not based on test scores, there's no exogenous running variable. Um, and so by comparing students that are put on the wait list, some of whom get in at the end of the day and some of whom don't, um, you know, we feel we're close, but still, you know, one can have a concern that admissions from the wait list could still be driven by this endogenous variation from these unobservables X2. And so here, again, we're going to rely crucially on the data that we have. 
from multiple different of these uh, elite private universities. And so the, the key idea here is that we don't observe the X2, but each of the admissions officers at these schools do observe the X2. And so let's say we're comparing a student who got in off the wait list at Brown versus a student who did not get in off the wait list at Brown. We wanna know are those two students different because of the epsilon or are they different because of the X2? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna to look to, at another school, let's say Columbia University. We're gonna ask whether Columbia University made on average similar admissions decisions about those two students with the idea that if, they, uh, if the two students really differ on these X2s, then Columbia is also gonna see the X2s and will admit the two students at different rates as well. Whereas if it's based on some idiosyncratic thing at Brown, Epsilon IJ, then Columbia University will admit those two students at an equal rate. So this is basically a test for selection where so long as these institutions are using these unobservables in a similar way, where similar means the same signed, uh, th those uh, gamma terms, um, then the test um, is a valid test for uh, selection. Um, and so uh, just again, skipping forward to not drag you through too much of the, um, the, the notation, um, here is how we implement the test. So again, somebody was, uh, uh, if you were just admitted to Brown without being put on the wait list, this says that half of those students were also admitted to Columbia University. If you were put on the wait list and eventually admitted, you're in the yellow, about 30% of the time you're admitted to Columbia. If you were on the wait list at Brown and not eventually admitted, again, about 30% of the time you're admitted to Columbia. So it looks like we're pretty much passing the test. Again, this is just totally raw, no controls. If you were never put on the wait list, if you were just rejected at Brown, uh, now only 10% of the time are you uh, admitted at Columbia. And so we find this reassuring because not only are the students who are admitted versus rejected off the wait list, very similar in their admissions outcomes at this other school. If anything, the students that are rejected are doing slightly better, but it's not statistically different. The test is appropriately picking up the fact that just comparing the students who are admitted versus the students that are rejected would not be a good comparison. Those students obviously do differ in their uh, not only unobservables, but their observables. Um, and so, you know, you can then, uh, you can do this again, you put in a bunch of controls, you, you do it um, more, more formally, um, you find that there's a really pretty good amount of balance here. And so, um, you know, the point is not that the students that are being admitted from the waitlist versus rejected from the waitlist are actually identical. It's clearly not random whether you get in off the waitlist or not. But the point is that they do not seem to differ a long ways that systematically lead to differences in long-term outcomes. So let me just uh, skip to now showing you the results. What do you get using this comparison? What you find is that the students who are admitted off the wait list in green have higher earnings, especially when you focus on uh, getting into their early 30s, um, getting into their careers, right? They don't really seem to have different earnings in um, their late 20s. Uh, we think largely because they're still getting into their careers and oftentimes they're, that's exactly the period when they're in graduate school, but you do see a significant effect um, at age 32 and age 33. As you see, the results are quite statistically imprecise because in order to look at these older students, we have to go right to the, uh, right to the edge of our data set. And so the final econometric thing we're gonna do to increase precision is we're gonna predict age 33 earnings using what employer you work for at age 25. That allows us to use historical tax data so we know based on you know, whether you're working at Goldman Sachs or whether you're working at some other firm, where your earnings trajectory is likely to go. And that allows us to kind of get the best of both worlds. We can use the long-term outcomes for students at age 33, but we can have an estimate of that on the much larger population of students that we're able to observe at age uh, 25, who just aren't quite old enough yet uh, for us to observe them at age uh, 33. So what do we find? Um, we find that students who uh, are admitted off the wait list versus rejected, they're about 2.5 percentage points more likely to uh, be predicted to earn in the top 1%. That's true uh, with controls. That's true if we drop all these students that are benefiting from these weird preferences I talked about in the first part of the talk. Final step, 
we have to find a way to interpret what is this two and a half percent. It's a comparison between going to a given school, going to Brown University when you get off the wait list versus going to whatever school you would have gone to if you didn't get off the wait list, right? So that's a very hard object to, uh, to understand. And in particular, what is that outside option? Here's a distribution across types of schools. The most common outside option for students who do not get in off the wait list is another Ivy Plus institution. And then there's a whole range of schools. And so what we're gonna do here is exploit the fact that we can actually know something about how outside options differ for uh, different students. Um, and so uh, intuitively what we're gonna do, again, let me not um, go into the details, we're gonna split students into those students over here on the right who have the best outside options and th therefore stand the least to gain from getting into an Ivy Plus school. We're gonna estimate a very small effect of getting in off the wait list versus students over here on the, the left who have much worse outside options based on where they live or what their uh, parents are earning. Um, those students who one would think have a lot to gain from uh, admissions to an Ivy Plus school do in fact seem to gain quite a bit. And it's not just that they gain more, they, you know, the slope of this line relates what we estimate them gaining quasi-experimentally versus what a, a baseline value-added model would have predicted. Um, and so this is saying that 87% of the variation is predicted by the value-added model. And so putting this all together, what, what do you get? Uh, you get that about uh, there's about a 4.6% percentage point increase in the uh, probability that a student ends up in the top 1% of the income distribution as a causal result of attending one of these Ivy Plus schools. Uh, how do you interpret that? That's about a 45% increase. And I showed you on that initial slide, it's not just earnings that uh, seem to be overrepresented among graduates of these schools. Uh, we see that uh, the students, uh, the causal effect of attending an Ivy Plus school, it more than uh, about doubles your chances of attending an elite graduate program. And it more than uh, triples your chances of working at firms that are using various definitions. I'm happy to go into this later, judge this kind of elite or prestigious. Prestigious is basically elite, but not money-making. Elite combines prestige and um, the ability to make money. So uh, let me, um, I'm gonna skip the, uh, the other um, half of, of identification to just focus on um, one final set of results in the paper. Uh, in order to think about the implications for policy, it's important to think about whether the factors that lead to these higher admissions advantages, like legacy preferences, athletic preferences, are they associated with better college outcomes or not, right? Because if they are, even if, um, uh, you know, even if it it's kind of seems unfair, a college might say, look, we just want people who are gonna be really great and have the best chance of success uh, uh, attending our school. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna to try to test this using these data uh, to see whether applicants who benefit in the admissions process from these characteristics uh, have higher potential outcomes in the sense of have higher uh, outcomes were they to attend any given college. Now, uh, what that's gonna look like is for instance, a comparison like this. So uh, students who, um, sorry, students who, um, are, uh, I'm doing this with a, a higher academic rating, students who, who, who receive these very high non-academic ratings, um, they are more likely to end up in the top 1% uh, than students who do not have high academic ratings, right? By about 0.6 percentage points. But just comparing these two sets of students in the applicant pool isn't the right comparison because as I showed you at the beginning of the talk, the students in green are more likely to be admitted to the schools that I just told you had a big causal effect on, uh, on earnings. So what we're gonna do is we're then gonna use our causal estimates to remove from this first set of bars, the difference in college value added, right? The difference in college value added is the second set of bars. When you have a high non-academic rating, you are predicted to attend a college that is 0.8 percentage points better uh, by this measure. And so if we just intuitively subtract the second set of bars out from the first set of bars, what you're left with is a comparison that says that 
uh, ex ante, before you've had that college advantage, students with these high non-academic ratings in green are actually no more likely to uh, earn high amounts of money in the labor force. And so we can do that now for all of these different particular sources of advantage, students who are the children of um, alumni are less likely to earn uh, large amounts of money. Athletes, there's no difference. Uh, these non-academic rating students, there are no difference. The only thing in the applicant pool that reliably predicts this uh, potential is one's academic rating, right? How strong you are on the test and other factors. And this is not only true looking at earnings as an outcome, this is also true looking at non-monetary outcomes like attending elite graduate schools and working at prestigious firms. So putting it all together, what do we get? What we find, and just, you know, here we kind of just put together a little bit of a counterfactual. If you start with the actual class that attends these schools, there are about 58% of students that come from the bottom 95% of the income distribution. If you were to first remove these preferences for the children of alumni, if you were to then get rid of this fact that we have sports teams largely composed of students from high-income families, if you were then to get rid of this fact that uh, students from high-income families benefit from particular advantages on these non-academic credentials, you could increase the share of students from the bottom 95% uh, from 58% up to 67%. So that's nine percentage points um, that's almost that same 168 students, right? About 150 extra students from low and middle income families. You could also do the same thing by instead of getting rid of the preferences that benefit high income students, you could just introduce preferences that specifically tried to benefit students from lower middle income families. And then finally, because of what I just showed you before this graph, the, 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 legacy preferences, athletic preferences, non-academic preferences, right? If anything, you are selecting students who have less potential in the long term. And so not only would this set of policies uh, diversify the student bodies, they would also increase the share of students who achieve these uh, top outcomes here. I'm showing it to you working at a prestigious firm, but you could um, uh, you, you can do this for any of, uh, of the outcomes. So uh, let me stop there. Really excited to uh, hear uh, comments from uh, Sebastian and then excited to discuss all of this with you. Thank you so much. This was great. Uh, Sebastian, do you need to present, uh, to present, show some slides or you're just going to talk? You're muted, muted. I'm, I'm um, not shy to share presentation or here. Can you see that? Yeah. All right. Can you see if I do something like uh, like this? Yes, I see the your smile. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, well, thanks a lot for the invitation to discuss this paper. Um, I have to say it's uh, well, it's pretty obvious, John, you must have heard this a lot. This is super impressive. It's kind of the dream that a you know labor economist uh, uh, would would like to pursue you know they have all these data about the, you know the colleges the applications and so on so it's uh, it's really really great and uh, um, I really admire the work that you have done I've been following your work since I, I now it's been almost 10 years uh, I, I think I started following your work uh, with the papers about teachers in 2014, 2013 or something like that. So um, let me, this, this is the, the, the content of the, of the, of the talk. Now, now I, I have some, <laughs> some questions that I, that I got while, while you were presenting. I'm just going to ask, I'm going to choose one which is this one, which I, I, I was expecting to hear in your presentation. I didn't see it in the paper or the, or the presentation, uh, the slides, which is like, what is the effect on the level of earnings? Um, and I'm like, I'm, I don't know what, what it is. And uh, one other thing that um, I think it was pretty important and, and you guys don't uh, showcase it uh, a lot is that this imbalance in the, in the uh, considering the waitlisted admits and rejects on the share of parents in the top 1% and the legacy status, which I think it's well defended that this does not affect identification. So I, I, I tend to agree with that. 
uh, it this is like a nice result and you guys are like okay we don't care i mean you you're defending and um your identification strategy saying oh this doesn't matter because these characteristics are not predictive of uh, long term outcomes but the, i think that this is like a super interesting result by itself because it's saying look i have this thought experiment these two guys are waitlisted okay they they are basically the same that's the spirit of the experiment but then uh, it turns out that the guys that are on the wait list but get lifted to be admitted are the ones uh, which uh, who have like powerful parents, right? A difference of 20% in the share of parents in the top 1% and a difference of 32% in the in the share of those with legacy status. So I think that's, that's I mean, we, we all have this, you know, intuitions but you guys here really are i believe you're nailing it down with the numbers and i think that's super important um so the, the summer this is super i'm gonna go super quick uh and for this uh, summarizing the paper but this is i think it's important to see if i understood anything <laughs> so let me see so this is top-notch work what i was saying in the beginning this is moving this is really moving the frontier of what we know about the admissions to highly selected colleges uh, everything is super impressive, but the, I think that one of the most impressive things to, is your capacity to condense all of this into one paper. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that there are many others coming down the road, right? But but that, I mean, coming with one paper of this is like a, a, an accomplishment by itself. Um, so this is why I, what I understood from the paper. Part one. Why are children from high income families more likely to attend these Ivy Plus colleges? Well, because of admission practices like legacy, athlete status, and high non academic ratings. But two, what is the causal impact uh, of admission on post college outcomes? Um, the short answer is that there, there is no impact on average earnings, but there is uh, about 60%. Uh, high likelihood to reach the top 1% of uh, of the income distribution at age 33. Uh, this is this is great. And I really like that you, I mean, solve the thing of, well, what is the counterfactual by saying, okay, we are comparing these guys to the average highly selected public flagship university. Part three, well, which credentials uh, are associated with better post-college outcomes, if anything? So one set of credentials are predictive like SAT scores and academic ratings, but then there are some credentials that are not informative about those, which are the ones that uh, were the answer for part one. So legacy, athlete status, and high non-academic ratings, uh, if understood correctly, are non-informative of what, what happens later on. And then the final part is like, well, can these colleges probably diversify um, the leaders? By changing their admission practices, short answer yes. <laughs> this is what I uh, this is what I understood from the paper. Um, so now, comments, comments. Um, first sentence in the abstract says that leadership positions in the U.S. are disproportionately held by graduates of a few highly selected private colleges, and it seems to me like like this reads like that this is like a special feature for the U.S. Um, but I think that this tends to be, this should be more than rule and than an exception, right? And I imagine that, you, I mean, this is probably just me and my own bias. Like if, I, if I'm writing the paper, I have to be prepared because the referees and the editor are going to say, oh, yeah, well, why is this Peruvian or Chilean or paper for India like relevant? Uh, and well, <laughs> if you have a paper uh, with the US data, that is less of a concern. But still, uh, and I think that... Um, the, there may be a gradient based on the development stage of the countries, but what, what do we know about this? I mean, is this uh, situation in the US, is this disproportion like a super big problem? And I'm not sure because I don't know to what, what is the benchmark to compare. Uh, so let me show you. Maybe there's something that, that you guys could do connecting this with uh, Samuel and Robinson's um, institution's explanation. Uh, well, and Robinson did something with Chilean data. So let me just show you a couple, uh, very quickly something about this. So this is like uh, like 60 years ago, the first cabinet of the president in Chile was composed by 81% of ministers that uh, who attended private schools, very exclusive private schools. 
Um, and something similar were happen was happening at the with the business elites, right? With uh, you know, only like they went like a quarter of them went to the same three schools. That this was was in the sixties, and then in in the <laughs> in in two thousand eight, now eighty six percent of the ministers of opinion. So it's if anything, like the like the elites seem to be shrinking. We were like, what, what, and then then I mean. It's, uh, take a look at this. This is like the fraction of uh, cabinet members from different uh, presidents, like separated about 40 years, uh, showing what's the fraction of those members uh, that studied in public high schools uh, and in private high schools. So, I mean, <laughs> this is basically it. So it doesn't seem to be like an American exception. And um, there is more. I mean, you can take a look by the specific high schools and so on. But basically, the the main takeaway is that this is uh, something that seems to happen, seem to happen also in Chile. And I, I guess this happens also that before I was showing you members of cabinet. Uh, so this is um, high executives in the government, but this also happens with the business elite, right? So and I tend to think that this is uh, something that repeats in other countries. Uh, so maybe. Maybe this paper help us to learn something that goes beyond the U.S. context, right? Which is like what <laughs> what the referees and the, the editor would tell me if I come with a paper about you know Venezuela or something like that. Why do we care? But, well, maybe this is informative of what so, something beyond the, just the U.S. So I would add something along these lines in the paper, and maybe we would get a better grasp of this attendance gap because like this is the sentence in the abstract saying like, hey, children coming from the top one percent are more than twice as likely to attend an AB plus, plus college than uh, middle uh, class families with comparable SAT scores. But I don't know, like twice is it, it's that, I mean, it sounds bad, right? That's that's how we read in the paper, but I'm not sure. So how much is it in, 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 in Chile, let's say? I have no idea. Uh, and, and overall, what, what is the rate that we would like to see? Is it like the same? Is, I don't know. It's, so this is something to, to think about. Uh, comment two, second sentence in the abstract. Um, could the highly selective private colleges increase the socioeconomic diversity uh, of these of these leaders by doing something? Um, and I I feel that 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 we are taking like a normative stand on this uh, along the paper. It's like. Uh, well, we we want we want to increase the socioeconomic diversity uh, of America's leaders, and I don't know. I mean, like, of course, we we tend to think that well, that that seems to be right. But uh, I missed a discussion on why a more diversified set of leaders is better, right? Uh, and and what do we know about this? So instead of taking this normative stand, well, let's come with the story about it with the, uh, what we what we know, evidence and, and theory behind it. So I, I'm not an expert on this field, but uh, I found the papers by, by Duflo on the impact of women's leaderships on, on leadership on policy decisions to be very informative. Like we care about like uh, diverse leaders because, well, they are gonna pr uh, provide us uh, with better and, um, Public goods, for example. Uh, so in the papers by 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 the flow, they say basically, hey, they these if you have women uh, making decisions, they will invest more in an infrastructure that is directly relevant for women, for example. And that's important. That's like welfare and enhancing. And it's not like, hey, we want just diverse leaders because we value diversity by itself. We want that diverse leaders because this ends up having an effect on welfare. Of people, this that is what I think that we e econs uh, <laughs> uh, like to um, think about this. So th there are other papers, like I mean, separating the uh, the results by for developing countries and developed countries, but that's basically the uh, what what's going on with women. And also there's another paper in EAR uh, with women helping women. So in the corporate leadership world, so not only in the policy world, but also in uh, 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 in, in, in leadership. So let me say something. Well, there are a couple of other papers, more from, I mean, and I guess that uh, you, um, you, John, at some point, maybe I'm wrong, at the beginning of your career, you were more on the sort of political economy side uh, rather than, and maybe well, you must be 
pretty familiar with these other papers. So I mean, the, I'm sure you will be super like uh, comfortable like with with these things. Like, hey, maybe maybe there, uh, what what attracts competent leaders, and this is political economy, and so on. So anyway, the the takeaway. So if we care about evidence and and welfare as economists, maybe I I would suggest to do the following. <laughs> You do whatever you want. But at the beginning of the paper, I would suggest taking an, an evidence and theoretical stand and not just saying, hey, let's let's uh, increase diversity because we value the diversity. But let's say, well, why our non-diverse set of leaders in the US is not great? And then why would it, what, why it would be good to diversify this set of leaders? And then you come with this sort of thing. And then at the end of the paper, and this is what the, the thing that I really, really missed, was to say, so right now it says, okay, if colleges if, um, do do X, they, if they change the, their admission practices, well, we will get a more diversified set of leaders. And then it stops. And I'm like, no, <laughs> why don't we complete this exercise by saying, look, now, if we, if we get this more diversified set of leaders, then we will get Z, something, policy improvements, more efficiency, more equity. Uh, now, if, if we ha if we have some Latino uh, as a leader in the U.S., well, maybe you are going to have more Latinos, and that's not only important in, ter in terms of equity, but because uh, you get you get more effi efficiency, uh, uh, you you are not losing human capital, right, and, and stuff like that. And, and and in the end, if if we if that produces policy improvements, uh, it may be welfare enhancing. So I, I I really sort of missed that both like at the beginning and the end something along these lines because the paper the title of the paper is like diversifying leaders had that part of the title not been there I would have been less you know worried about this thing I mean maybe it's easier to just <laughs> uh, drop that part of the uh, in, of the title uh, comment three and I'm just closing this is just um, for the for the audience but half about half of the paper. Is figuring out what drives admissions. That I found found that super funny because we, I mean, this is because of the holistic admission system that you John mentioned in in in, in your talk. But, uh, uh, and we 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 should appreciate what we have in Chile, which is this admission system that is centralized since 1967. And we most of the time we know what drives admissions. So I I know I think that, that this is just to say. Uh, look, and there are some papers. I'm, 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 I think that you you must be aware of this uh, uh, recent paper um, doing something similar to. I mean, in spirit to what to what you're doing in 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 your paper with your co-authors, John. And then here I have a couple of co-authors, Andres and and Chris. Uh, well, there's a set set in there. So they have the 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 RD uh, to to do something causal too, and they have like longer. Uh, term data. Um, so they have basically if parents went to the elite high uh, elite um, colleges, uh, and and they are able to to estimate things intergenerationally, which is something that it's not really there in the, in, in in the paper. But that that's fine. Uh, so and there is one the another one in which I'm I'm a co-author in which is we, we are just describing what happened in these fifty years of uh, college entrance exams, and basically. We have more and more women eligible for elite uh, college and majors, five five times, and and uh, about four times more ethnically descendants uh, people uh, uh, being eligible for these for for these elite college majors, and the the, the fraction of uh, people in the low socioeconomic status also increases like by four. So I don't know. I just wanted to show that it's ongoing work, uh, but it's 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 super nice. So thanks a lot. And I really really enjoyed reading and and commenting this paper. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, if you want to write questions, do you want to react a little bit, John? While people maybe write something or yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Um, thank you so much, Sebastian, for those. Uh, really interesting and 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 thoughtful comments. Um, let me. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, on, on some of these things, like on uh, why uh, diverse leaders might or might not be a good thing. I think we we could we could chat for uh, for many hours here. Uh, but um, I I really appreciate your connection with 
um, a lot of the very interesting work that's been going on in Chile recently. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I've seen um, many of these papers and I actually think that uh, there's a very um, interesting connection between how we observe different admission systems in different places and yet in different ways, uh, kind of inequality of opportunity still creeps through. And so, you know, my, um, you know, very quick summary of the difference between what we find and what, for instance, um, uh, Seth Zimmerman and co-authors finds in, in the papers that you mentioned, right, is that right in, in the U.S., um, right, or is it in Chile, there's uh, this, you know, quite meritocratic test score based system. Um, and so almost by definition, right, the, uh, the tests that I was looking at on admissions rates would be totally flat given a test score uh, across the parent income distribution. Um, but the, the inequality really creeps in because it seems like there are quite heterogeneous returns to students coming from different backgrounds. Whereas in the US, and, and uh, to be fair, I did not stress this in, in my presentation, we find almost exactly the opposite in the sense that uh, there are these uh, quite large inequalities in admissions, even among students that look uh, pretty uh, similarly academically qualified, um, where we don't find differences is in the outcomes. It seems like students uh, really, no matter the, uh, their background, seem to benefit from attending these schools uh, and if anything, for one particular reason, uh, it, can, it goes a little bit in the opposite direction. Um, so just to be precise about that, comparing a student who attends any two pairs of schools. So does a student attend Brown instead of attending UC Berkeley? That causal effect seems quite similar across most students, whether they are uh, their race or their parent income uh, or whatever. Where students really differ though, is what their outside option is in the sense that when a student doesn't get into Brown, if they come from a high income family, they'll go to another slightly lower ranked private school that also has uh, a maybe slightly less strong, but, but still quite large causal effect on these upper tails uh, outcomes. When lower income students, and it really, especially middle income students don't get into Brown, they tend to fall much further down the kind of value added chain. And so uh, that's really, um, if anything, the, uh, the source of, of differences where on the margin, the, the, the admitted student from a middle income family benefits more. Um, and so I actually think it's really interesting to see, uh, despite this fact that you flagged at the beginning about how there's this concentration of elite, um, background in these leadership positions, that seems like something that uh, crops up in many, many different societies across the world. The fact that it comes from these two very different channels, at least in the context of higher education in the United States and Chile, um, I, I thought was a really um, kind of a neat and unexpected um, connection. Um, let me also, um, uh, you know, in the interest of, um, saying a little bit more about um, some results that I, I didn't show. Um, if I can uh, share my screen again quickly. Um, let me go up here. So that, right, there's a question of um, where is it in the income distribution that we're really seeing these large effects? And um, we do see, I think it, it's, it's a little bit misleading and, and this was really our fault. We, we changed this in a recent draft and, and it's Sebastian, you probably, I, I, did, I should have sent you the most recent version. Um, we do find an increase in average earnings. So it's not like there's an increase in, in the top 1% without there being any increase in average earnings. Um, but what we do see is that the increase in earnings is incredibly concentrated in the very upper tail. So the way you should think about what's going on with these schools is that it's really, it, you're not really that much more likely to get like an average job or not. What you're doing is you're buying a lottery ticket where some fraction of people are gonna get really outstanding jobs. Some of them will be outstanding because they'll earn millions of dollars. Some of them will be outstanding because they'll be 
um, you know, Nobel Prize winning scientists, or they'll be, you know, aspirational entrepreneurs or other, other things like that. So let me just show you this in the context of the income distribution. What I'm showing you here is uh, a plot of quantiles of the income distribution now at age 33, comparing students from Ivy Plus schools in green to the highly selective flagship schools in, in blue. Um, there's no adjustment here. This is just like a raw comparison. And so what you see is that uh, these uh, percentiles differ a lot at the very, very top. So for instance, the 99th percentile of income for students that attend Ivy Plus schools is $1.9 million of annual earnings at age 33, right? That is just an astounding amount of income. And it's not that students who attend these highly selective flagship, the public schools don't ever make that much money, but it's more like, you know, 0.2% of them do, right? It's a much smaller share. Similarly, at Ivy Plus schools, you see that about 5% are making more than about $600,000 a year at age 33, and only about 1% of the students from these highly selective flagship public universities are making more than $600,000 a year. Now, this comparison, of course, doesn't do any adjustment, but when you adjust for all the stuff in a way that gets you close to what our causal estimates are, what you find is that uh, much of that difference remains. And so here, you should think about the difference between the green and the yellow as a version of our causal effect up in the tail here. For instance, um, you know, 5% of Ivy Plus students get above $600,000 and only 2% of their counterfactual attending Ivy Plus, uh, attending um, these public schools. So we're increasing by a factor of two and a half the chances of somebody making over $600,000 a year, right? That's way, way up in the tail. Similarly, we're increasing by a factor um, of about three, making more than $2 million. So what's really going on here is where we're increasing the chances of students earning way, way up in the tail in a way that does increase um, average earnings, but it's really doing so by pulling out the tail. It's not just shifting the mean. It's it's take kind of taking the tail um, and pulling it out. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that people have. I don't see anything in the open question. Well, people are really usually shy with their, their English. Uh, I'm gonna just for matters of time. I'll I'll, I'll have more one question. I'm Please. more a, a little opposite of a. Uh, so still, I'm really believing the first principle of role. So, but what worries me actually, looking at your data and having the Supreme Court intervene with affirmative action, is more about the middle income because I feel like, in a way, it's it it validates the university to uh, admit very poor students. It's kind of easier to detect, right? There, as you said, x one, x two. Like if you're born from a poor family. You're, and you're an excellent student, really, is, and you have a high SAT score, it's really like, okay, this is a special guy, right? But I worry about like the, the middle income because there are a lot of students, there are a lot of students that are as skilled and as a higher income students. So I wonder, is there a space to modify or to have a special uh, admission for middle class, given that they are the ones that, in a way, support yeah. American democracy after all. You know? No, no, I think that's a great question. And I, I think that um, you're exactly right. Uh, there's been a ton of focus on, you know, rightly so, on access for very low income students. Um, there's uh, a ton of access already for students coming from high income families. And it really is that, that middle that kind of loses out. Um, and you know, I think that I would almost frame the question a little bit differently than you. Uh, you know, maybe we do want some kind of special admissions regime, regime for middle-income students, but I think we can do quite a bit just by getting rid of all the crazy stuff for the high-income people, right? You know, to kind of phrase it differently, you know, whether you want to put a thumb on the scale for middle-income students is one question. A different question is whether we should take the thumb off the scale for high income students. And I think in particular, right, this is a policy debate which is playing out in real time in the United States where, uh, again, to, to, to you know, give more institutional context, um, in 2020, when the pandemic hit, many schools 
um, started relying even less on academic measures like test scores and said that, you know, in that particular year, people were very concerned that students literally might not get to take the test. And so they said, hey, it's okay if you, if you, um, if you don't want to submit the test score. What that's led to, though, is somewhat of a migration away from, from relying on test scores out of a, you know, entirely reasonable concern that students from high-income families have advantages that allow them to do better on the test. Right? And of course, there are advantages that they have by going to better schools and growing up in different environments that allows them to do better on the test because they're just more academically prepared. There are also advantages where maybe they get special tutoring and that allows them to do better on the test. Um, but what I think that really, um, you know, the reason that I, I, uh, I worry about that movement is that I think what our uh, results show is that, you know, sure, maybe test scores aren't perfect, but the, the, the stuff that you would replace test scores with seem to be, if anything, one, much more tilted against students from especially the middle class and towards high income students. And second, they seem much, much less obviously related to uh, the type of long term outcomes that one hopes to gear towards in a meritocratic system. And so, you know, if if students are competing to get into school and that makes them study harder, right? We still might want to avoid uh, the rat race and people might study too hard, but at least that will lead to better long-term outcomes. You know, all of the, you know, there, uh, there there's, um, again, I think part of this is just uh, getting people to understand how, uh, how different and odd the US system is. I'm gonna show you a, uh, there's a picture that um, a colleague of mine sent me after I presented this paper. So I'm gonna see if I can, I'm gonna see if this works. Is that, uh, is that coming through? Uh, not quite, okay. Let me, let, me read, let, me, let, me, let me read this to you. This is, a, this is a billboard on the side of the road in uh, San Francisco. It is an advertisement for a school where children can come to learn how to fence, like sword fight, as an extracurricular activity. It says, fencing is a fun sport that will help, colon. Three reasons that you might wanna to come to the fencing school. Number one, you can enhance performance at work and at school. Number two, you can enhance speed, coordination, and decisiveness. Number three, get accepted into top US colleges. Right, they're just not. They're not even not even making it explicit. It's just like you know the notion that you know whether you have gone to the fencing academy uh, has anything to do with going to one of these schools. And the fact that that might convince students to spend all their time learning how to fence seems just unbelievably crazy to me. And moving away from that um, in any of the ways that we've talked about seems like a huge improvement. Okay. So I think you want to say something. I think we we have to wrap up after that because then yeah yeah you know. super sure. So so I, I'm I so John the, the 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 effect that you just showed us in terms of income it's probably I would say for sure it's the largest effect in uh, that I have seen in my entire life. Probably the the highest the largest that I, I will I will see. So I, I I think that that this is something that should be high, that deserves to be highlighted in the paper. Um, this is really and 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 you guys have data up until you know, uh, thirty three years old, uh, and I I feel that this gap or this effect might even uh become like larger over time because like once you hop on this totally agree. Uh, Jobs and basically, I mean, it's, it's you, 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 see, you see that you see that in, in the estimates as well. Now, just to be clear, right? If you include all income, uh, the effect on log income is about uh, ten percent. All right. So, from like a average return, it's not enormous. Um, but yeah, you're right. Debate. Like up in the tail, there's huge amounts of money. Yeah, exactly. It's it's ten percent over. I don't know how much. It's it's. it's it, it's it's a lot. I I could live my whole life with that ten percent point. <laughs> so <laughs> so no, I would just just highlight that. Uh, and and the last thing is that I think that um maybe you guys are already working on this, but there there is an IO sort of an IO paper here, which is like 
uh, when when you get at this idea of oh the the um, colleges should should change their their way of uh, of making admissions, well that's taking into account their objective function and how are they like demanding students and well if they're doing this is for some for some reason right and it's not like oh yeah we're gonna change our practices uh, and and I think that there's an IO paper there like instead of studying uh, students studying the other side of the market, uh, uh, how do we, they, they react and, and, and so on. So, well, thanks a lot. I, I really, really enjoyed this. Well, thank you so much for all of your uh, really um, very interesting and thoughtful comments. And thank you so much, Bernardo, for the invitation. Um, next time we will have to do this in Chile. Thank you. We'll be very happy to have you here one day. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sebastian. All right. And this is great. I'm going to send you the recording when I have it. Bye.